Welcome to this video on Civil Service Fast Stream and Summer Internships. The Civil Service Fast Stream is essentially the Government Graduate Scheme for the Civil Service. There are 17 different streams and I will explain what all of those are. The shortest of them is two years and the longest is five years, but they all recruit in the same way, have the same starting salary of £31,000 and that earning potential on completion, which is a direct quote from them, but is a very genuine commitment that most people on finishing will earn somewhere in the region of £45,000 to £55,000. You can be located anywhere in the UK and you should be prepared to move throughout the fast stream as that's pretty common. Their website is really clear and the best place to go for information. Um, do take a look. It's really helpful. Faststream.gov.uk. They open this year, 2024, on the 10th of October and close on the 7th of November. And they've just introduced two new streams, one in cybersecurity and one in risk management. At the moment, they're also recruiting for the summer internship programme. That's exactly the same deadlines as the fast stream itself. This one is open to people in their last or penultimate year of their degree. So for most undergraduates, that will look like the second and third year. But of course, if you're on a four year course, that will be the third and fourth year. The summer internship programme happens over the summer, as the name suggests. Uh, you get a salary of £430 a week. Again, it can be at different places in the UK and you need to be predicted a 2-2 in any degree subject. And there's lots of information about that as well. It has the same initial online tests as the fast stream and then progresses slightly differently. But I'll go into all of that as we go through the video. I've had a couple of questions and one of those was about whether there are any specific programs or support networks for underrepresented groups. And I'm mentioning this here because the summer internship program used to be specifically diversity focused and only open for certain groups to apply for. But that's not the case anymore. Anyone can apply for it now. However, there are lots of programmes if you are from an underrepresented or marginalised group, and I encourage you to go and check those out in the Going Forward Into Employment website, which is linked here. Once you're in the civil service, there are lots of support networks for different demographics as well. Another common question is whether these positions are open to international students. Look, you need to go and check the nationality rules yourself and see how they apply for you. But broadly speaking, they are, of course, open to anyone who is a British citizen, including dual nationals. Uh, but there are also positions that are open to Commonwealth citizens and people in the economic area, uh, sorry, the European economic area um, who have settled status. You do need to have the right to work in the UK as well. But as I say, do check those rules, check that they're up to date for you yourself. The process is very competitive. In 2023, they had just over a thousand places and nearly 88,000 applicants. You may be a little bit reassured to know that that has dropped. There were actually even more applicants for slightly fewer places in 2022. And I'll come on to the numbers this year, but actually there's slightly more places open this year. Lots of people find that they apply more than once. Uh, it's really common to get through on your second or third or even fourth attempt. Uh, some people, of course, are lucky and get through on their first attempt as well. They recruit anonymously, so they won't know how many times you've applied. And there is no kind of time limit on how close you are to graduating. So you could still apply 20 or 30 years after graduation. OK, let's look at some of the different streams. So. This is the degree class requirements. Most of them require a 2-2 predicted or if you've already graduated that you've got a 2-2 and um, I've listed those here. There are a few which ask for a 2-1, although look at those three at the bottom with the asterisks. For those streams, they will also accept you if you have a 2-2 at bachelor's level, if you have another degree as well. So typically a master's after that. And finally, we have our science and engineering stream, which does require a 2-1 and also some kind of higher degree or chartered membership of a particular um, profession, something like engineering. Degree subject requirements. Well, again, most of the streams are open to anyone regardless of what they've studied and have a look at those because some of them might surprise you a little bit. Things like finance, digital and data, they're happy with anyone from any background. 
there are some subject specific requirements and broadly these are what you'd expect so the economic streams there's two of them they want you to have a degree in economics or something very similar the operational research stream as well as the statistical service want people to have a highly numerate degree subject science and engineering is perhaps self-explanatory and the social research is for social scientists Lots of people want to know how you should choose a stream. At the point of applying, you choose four, you can't put down more than that, and you put them in order of preference. You can't add to or change the order of your preferences once you've selected them. So make sure you've got broadly what you hoped at that early stage. The system works by if you're successful in your application to your first preference, you get appointed to that scheme. But if not, they'll look at your second and third and fourth preference. I have heard of people being allocated to a stream that they hadn't even requested. It, it does happen. So how might you choose them? Well, the most sensible thing to do is what interests you the most which ones sound interesting. And if you're not quite sure what they involve and you want to learn a little bit more about them, there's some case studies and blogs that will help you to find out the typical day in the life of someone doing that work. You might want to consider which ones are most competitive and I've got some statistics on that in a moment. And for some of them, they offer you the opportunity of getting another qualification. So if that really appeals, here's some of those uh, on screen now. If actually you're not up for more study and you'd rather avoid that, then it might be that you would choose another stream instead. It's worth mentioning at this point that once you're in the civil service and you finish the fast stream, it's very possible to move around. So if there's something you really had your heart set on, but you're appointed to another stream, it might be worth considering whether you want to do that to get your foot in the door and then try and move across later. People do do that. Here's some advice from one of your former Cambridge alumni now working in the fast stream. And her experience was she really wished she'd put a little bit more thought into all four streams, because in her case, she thought hard about the first two preferences and then kind of put two more down without really thinking it through in any detail. But actually, as you'll find when you read the quote, um, it was the fourth choice which turned out to be a really great fit for her. So she encourages you to really think about all four options, have an open mind, don't just apply to the one that you think looks like the best without kind of really reflecting on what suits you as an individual. I said I had some statistics on how competitive it was. You can see them here with the, um, I've ordered them by percentage. So at the top of the table is the kind of one with the highest success rate, perhaps the least competitive in inverted commas. Although you can see, you know, the majority of people still weren't appointed. It's none of these are over 50%. Um, but right down to the bottom where the kind of most competitive ones are. That does change a little bit year on year, but there's some patterns here that, um, we really kind of see continuing diplomatic service is always very popular. Here are for the number here are the numbers for this year. This is how many vacancies they're advertising. It doesn't always completely match up, so it might be that the number of offers doesn't totally match the number of vacancies, but normally they're pretty close. So you can see 250 places on the summer internship. Um, and then the fast stream streams listed below that with di diplomatic and development economics being the most competitive because there's the fewest places available for that. I also wanted to share these statistics, which are the success rates by different demographics. All the language here is chosen from the civil services own publications. And the point to make really is that they're very transparent about this information. I don't have any inside track. Anyone can get hold of this data. They publish it because it's important to them that they're sort of transparent with the general public about what's the, the sort of work that's going on within the civil service and what's the makeup of the workforce. Uh, this is specifically about the fast stream, I should say, though, not the general civil service. The main point to raise here is that it is really important to them that they become more diverse. And that's very much rooted in the idea that the civil service should represent the population that it's serving. So it should be broadly similar to the wider British population. It's also worth noting 
that within the um, civil service more broadly, we see greater diversity at early entry level roles and a little bit less as you move into more senior roles. And that's pretty typical of the workforce generally. That's not specific to the civil service, but it is a pattern to be aware of. There are no shortcuts with this process. The honest truth is that it can be a bit time consuming and it's worth taking the time to understand it and think about it seriously if you're keen to progress. However, people sometimes look at those competitive statistics and think, my goodness, you've got to be stellar top of the class. You've got to have done all these amazing things to even be in with half a chance. And that's not the case at all. This isn't about being the best of the best of the best by some kind of external measure. It's about whether you have the right approach, the strengths and behaviours and mindset. And try not to put too much pressure on yourself. I know that's easy to say when you know it's a really competitive process, but you're not doing yourself any favours if you get yourself really stressed and thinking you've got to meet this impossible ideal. You really don't. It's about doing your research, understanding what they're looking for and showing the best of yourself that you possibly can. Having said all of that, what is the process? Well, for the fast stream, it starts with some online tests. Some of the schemes have some additional information required. Do check which ones they are. It's all available on the website. There's an assessment centre and then a final selection board for most of them. The vast majority have this final selection board aspect. The summer internship program has the same online tests, an application form and then a telephone interview. So it's a slightly shorter and easier process to recognise that it's a slightly shorter opportunity as well. Your timeline will be unique. Keep a close eye on your email and check the homepage on the applicant's application system. It can be kind of strangely slow and then also very quick. You might wait weeks to hear and everyone else around you seems to be getting emails and yours still hasn't come. I've even met students who think, well, I haven't heard and everyone else did. They must have decided not to give me a place. And then suddenly the email lands in their inbox and they'll never really know why theirs took much longer to come than their friends did. But here we are. However, once you get that email, there are really tight time limits about how long you have to complete the next bit of the process. So once it arrives, you do need to act on it. And I'll go through the timelines as we progress through the rest of the video. If you have a disability, they invite you to request adjustments through an application form. And I'd really encourage you to do that to give yourself the best opportunity to showcase your talents and potential alongside your peers. It's not being used in any kind of negative way. There won't be discrimination. It's literally to help you out in the process. If they can do something to help you address barriers, they want to do that for you. For all stages, you should keep in mind the success profiles. You can find these online, just Google civil service success profiles, civil service behaviours, and they will turn up. These are the basis of all the recruitment that they do. This is what you are being judged against. Um, that's true in any civil service job, and it's true of the fast stream too. This is what the behaviours look like for the fast stream. And for the fast stream, they're judged at level three. And there's an explanation of what that means on the behaviours themselves. It will tell you what they're looking for at level one, level two, level three, level four, and so on. These are the behaviours you're judged against. I'm not going to read them through here, but it will give you an idea of the sort of qualities they're looking for. So whatever stage in the process that you're in, of course, you should be honest. You should talk about your own skills and experiences. But what your assessors are looking for is how well those match up to these kinds of behaviours. Don't just take my word for it. Here are your predecessors. These are all quotes from Cambridge alumni saying how important it is and how helpful it is to read those success profiles. You'll see some people calling them civil service behaviours. Broadly speaking, we're talking about the same thing um, or the civil service values. It's really helpful to familiarise yourself with them take a bit of time to do that. So the tests. Find yourself a quiet, calm, distraction free place to do the tests. And remember, practice makes perfect. There are three online tests. 
using data, work-based scenarios and the case study assessment. You have five days to complete them and they're not timed, but they give you a rough guide that they expect most people will take about 90 minutes to complete them. They do appear in a particular order, which you can't change. So you can't choose to start with your favorite or your least favorite, but you can stop and start and have a break if you need to. I'd really recommend you do the practice test. That's what I mean by practice makes perfect. There's the uh, website there, gov.uk, um, civil service online tests. They are genuinely models of the types of tests that you will end up doing. So go and practice them. Go and do those particular tests. The um, names and the data they use will be different, but you'll be really familiar with the format. You do get some automatically generated feedback after the tests, and they aim to respond to everyone by early December. Um, a little bit of warning that it's fairly generic feedback you saw in that previous slide, 88,000 applicants. It's not a kind of personalized email. It is uh, kind of algorithmically generated. So have a look. It might be helpful, um, but try not to take it too much to heart. If you've had a look at the online tests that the civil service provide first and you think you still want a bit of extra practice, do check out Graduates First, which is the resource that uh, the Career Service here at Cambridge has subscribed to. So if you are a Cambridge student or an alum, you can get access to this through our website. You don't need to pay for it. We have paid the subscription and you can practice some other similar tests, but they are slightly different formats. So that's why I say look at the uh, government provided ones first so that you'll kind of recognize which ones in graduate first will be most helpful for you. Some advice from your predecessors again. It can be a demanding process, say some of our previous applicants. And if you haven't done maths for a while, it's worth just refreshing your skills. I know this is an area that people worry about. It's not really high level, complicated maths. You definitely don't need a maths degree, but it is worth just brushing up on your skills if you haven't used them for a while. Um, Give yourself plenty of time to practice and read. Again, this is just people backing up what I'm saying. Um, and uh, again, just some more people saying, do think about it. Do think about the success profiles. What might they be looking for? Um, although having said that, answer honestly, say what you yourself would really choose to do. But if you're not quite sure, those success profiles will help you to understand what might be kind of valued in the civil service itself. For additional information or the video interviews, um, you might want to think about using the STAR technique. And I'm just going to go through this very quickly. There's lots of other information about it, including on our uh, other videos on our YouTube channel and elsewhere as well. So if you're asked a question like, can you give an example of when you had to think about the bigger picture? Um, any kind of question that says, tell me about a previous experience, you can use the STAR technique to help you with that. And the STAR technique is the S stands for situation, just a sentence or two about what it is that was happening so that they understand what was going on. You won't get any points for this. And when I say points, I'm literally talking about the scoring system that they use. So don't spend a lot of time on it. You're just helping whoever's doing the assessment to understand what you're talking about. Similarly, the task, one or two sentences, you don't need to go into a lot of detail. What were you trying to achieve? What problem were you trying to solve? What you get assessed for is your actions. So this should be the majority of your answer, about two thirds. What did you do? How did you do it? Why did you do it like that? What did you think about it? What choices did you make? Really delve into the detail here. This is what they're scoring. And then finally, it doesn't need to be really long, but you do need to mention it. What was the result? Did you achieve the problem or did you solve the problem or achieve the objective that you were trying to? Were you successful? And um, although it doesn't have to be long, it is really important to include it. This whole process is designed to try and be very fair and very transparent to everyone. Whether your experience that you're describing was for a really top prestigious organization at a really competitive internship, or whether it was working in your local corner shop or organizing your best friend's birthday party, 
it doesn't matter. They will not score you any higher depending on where it happened. What matters is what did you do and what was the effect of what you did? That's the bit to focus on. So please don't worry about choosing the right situation. Choose the situation where you think you can illustrate that your actions were sensible, thoughtful and had a good impact. The additional information I'll just mention here, you get seven days to provide that. So again, keep an eye on your email, check the applicant homepage, make sure you don't miss the deadline. The number of questions you get asked will vary depending what stream you're on. You can usually answer them in any order. They aim to assess them and to let you know whether or not you've passed in two weeks, but there isn't any feedback at this stage of the process. You might then, if you're successful at that stage, get invited to an assessment centre. They've slightly changed the way the assessment centres work this year. They're very clear that your performance in each of these three exercises will be marked completely independently by different people who won't see each other's scores. So the person who marks your personal development conversation will have no idea what you did in the written advice exercise and vice versa. They also won't see any of your scores from earlier in the process. So again, this is designed to try and give everyone the most equal opportunity of achieving well to try and prevent bias in your assessors. There is lots of guidance and examples of these three different exercises on the web page. Here it is. You should definitely read them before you go to the assessment centre. They're not trying to trick you. They're trying to help you. They've given you this information because they want to see you at your best. And try and hold on to that at the, on the day as well. The assessors are there looking for your best qualities. You don't need to do any specific preparation for any element of this. It's not testing prior knowledge. It's looking at your analytical skills from the information they give you on the day and also your kind of general approach to how you do things. The assessment centre, and again, this is new this year, is assessed against the four dimensions assessment framework called 4D. They're assessing your ability to think, to tackle complex issues, contributing effectively to the government's objectives and the well-being of the public. They're testing your ability to relate. So this is about interpersonal skills, inclusive teamwork, driving and being innovative and delivering something impactful that, again, benefits the public and the government. You'll see this as a recurring theme. They're looking for people who can be agile and forward thinking, who can adapt, who can have different approaches, which are really important for the kind of multifaceted and evolving policy landscape that you'll work in. And finally, they're looking for your strive, your motivation, your qualities, which will help you to be um, effective in government roles and also in leadership roles. The Fast Stream is a leadership programme. So that's one of the reasons that they're looking for this and they're particularly looking for it here. The written exercise takes 85 minutes. They make a suggestion that you could spend about 20 minutes on preparation, reading the materials, 60 minutes on writing your response and then five minutes at the end reviewing. It is only a suggestion. They're not going to kind of push you to do that in any way. If you know that you are someone who is really quick at reading or really slow at reading or really quick at writing, you know, make your adjustments so that this suits you. Um, they're assessing your ability to think, relate and strive. They'll give you a range of materials to read and analyse. This is a new process, so I don't know it well, but from the suggestion, from what I've read on the website, I think they might give you some videos as well, but I'm not clear if that's instructions in the videos or if there might be some videos to analyse. I just don't know. They'll provide a template for your answer and they're looking for you to write clearly and succinctly. This is a really important um, quality to have in policy work, to be able to distill something down, to make it very easy to understand while still retaining enough detail that it's accurate and nuanced and has enough of the kind of underlying argument. The stakeholder communication exercise, the timings here are really specific. You will be given 35 minutes of preparation time to review the materials. After those 35 minutes, 
your assessor will turn up and they will um, take part in a 30 minute role play with you. There's an overarching policy theme, so it's going to have some connection to the written exercise, but it won't be exactly the same. It will just be on a sort of broadly similar area. They will assess, think, relate, adapt and strive in this section. And they're suggesting that one of the things they're looking for is that you should be able to think on your feet, prepare yourself for the unexpected and think creatively. And this really reminds me in the old assessment centre, they had uh, a similar thing where partway through um, a role play, the assessor would come up with a, an emerging policy issue that you then had to react to. So I wonder if this might be something similar that you'll have all the material to prepare, but then part way through the role play, something new will come up that you need to take into account. Again, I don't know that. I don't have an inside track here. That's just a guess on my part, but I'd say it's a sort of fairly educated guess. If that is what happens, if it is something like that, breathe, take a moment give a thoughtful, measured response. You don't need to know exactly what to do right away, but they do want to see how you would approach it. What are you thinking about? How are you tackling that issue? And for some of you, you might find it helpful to draw in skill on skills that you developed in supervision here at Cambridge. It's absolutely fine to refer to your briefing notes if you need to. If you've forgotten something, this isn't a memory test. Look back and check. And there's a suggestion that at the end, they'll ask you to reflect honestly on your performance. So they might ask you, how did that go? What do you think? Is there anything that could have been improved? And be honest here. If there is something, absolutely fine to say, do you know what? Looking back on that, I wonder if I should have tackled it in a different way for these reasons. They're not looking for perfection, but they are looking for people who are thoughtful and reflective and self-aware. And that brings us on to the third exercise, which is the personal development conversation. It's 30 minutes with your assessor. Remember, it will be a new assessor, not the same person you saw last time. They'll ask you a mix of strength and behavioural questions. They're assessing rela Relate, Adapt and Strive. They're really keen in their guidance that people don't over prepare for this. They don't want to hear kind of pre-learnt rote answers that you're trying to shoehorn into that particular question because you thought about it in advance. They're trying to get more of a conversational feel. Um, and one of the things they say is they really hope that you feel comfortable expressing your true self. They even say they hope that you enjoy it and find it interesting and feel reassured that they are interested in you as an individual and not as a kind of cog in a machine or someone who's got to try and pretend to be perfect. I don't know. I know some people don't enjoy interviews, no matter how relaxed and informal it might be. But I think it's really nice that they're trying to encourage people to see this in a positive way and not as a kind of scary judgment. So I hope that if you get to that stage, you do find it a helpful conversation. And it seems pretty clear that they're looking for some honesty and authenticity at this stage. So spend a bit of time reflecting on what your strengths and qualities are go in with an open mind, ready to kind of talk about those. Their website has some good advice, the sort of thing I often end up telling students myself, so I've borrowed some of it here. Look, it's easier said than done, but do try and relax, try and just be yourself and enjoy the day. It may help you to know that nerves and excitement can feel very similar, apparently, physiologically. So if you're feeling really nervous and your heart is going a little bit fast, you might find it helpful to instead tell yourself, do you know what, I'm really excited about this. It's really exciting to have a new experience. That might not work for some of you, but I hope it's useful for some people. Try and approach it with a spirit of curiosity and finding out if the civil service fast stream really is a good option for you. Remember that your assessors can only give you credit for what you actually say, write and do on the day. This is not a place to be subtle or imply things. Talk through your process out loud. Give enough details that they know what you did and why. Remember, they're not trying to trip you up. They really are trying to help you. But because, again, of this idea that it's really important that everyone is um, recruited under equal opportunities, the assessor simply can't kind of decide, oh, well, 
this candidate probably meant that, so I'll give them credit for it. I'll score them in that box anyway. You have to actually explicitly say it. You don't need to do equally well in every single exercise. So if something hasn't quite gone as well as you'd hoped, try and just put it to one side. Go into the next exercise with a positive frame of mind if you can. The process is actually designed so that if you don't do quite so well in one of the other exercises, you can perform better in another and kind of bring your score up a bit. Almost no one is going to be equally brilliant at every single exercise. It's perfectly normal to have made a mistake and still be offered a place. Do read the instructions carefully, do follow them. And if you're not sure about something, ask, preferably before the exercise begins. Don't feel embarrassed about that. Again, it won't be counted against you. They want to help you. They want you to do well. They want you to know that they want to know that you have all the information you need. The exercises do require you to work fairly quickly, and that's because they're hoping to kind of reflect the demands of work when you get into the civil service. It's called the fast stream for a reason. So keep an eye on the clock. Use your time as effectively as you can. OK, what if you don't get through? Well, it's going to depend really what your motivations were for applying. If you really want to work for the civil service, if that's your main motivation, then you can just apply for a job at the civil service. You don't have to go through the fast stream. There's a website there, the civil service jobs um, website, where you can see and apply for lots of different roles. And I will send this guide out. This is entering the labyrinth. And I'll also put the link in the description for this video underneath. Um, this is the unofficial guide to civil service applications produced by two people working for the civil service who are just trying to help you understand a little bit more of what it's like to work there. A good opportunity, um, if you see it, is executive officer. That's broadly the kind of considered the same grade, the same level as somebody who's starting on the far stream. So it's a pretty good bet for a similar role. Um, but if you do have a bit more experience, you're looking for something a bit more senior, or you just want to try and understand it better, have a look at that link, the Institute for Government uh, Grade Structures in the Civil Service Explainer. That goes into a bit more detail as well. And remember what I said earlier, once you're in the civil service, if you do get in by another route, you can often have access to different roles that are advertised internally. Well, what if it wasn't about the civil service and you're applying because you really wanted to do a graduate scheme? There's lots of different ones, but if you were interested in the public sector and a graduate scheme, we do have our directory of those on uh, Handshake and you can see them there. Lots and lots of different graduate schemes for different public sector bodies. You might also be interested in public sector consultancy and the same link will take you to the public sector, uh, sorry, to the consultancy directory, which you can then go and have a look at the public sector area. So two guides there that will be really helpful. There's um, the lovely Nathan White, who actually Nathan is one of the people who wrote that Entering the Labyrinth guide that I just mentioned. He's got an interview with us on his blog. He started out his career working in the Unlocked Graduate Scheme. That's the Prisons Graduate Scheme. And he now works from the, for the civil service. So it is possible to make those moves if you wanted to later on. I asked previous applicants where they applied to, and you can see a huge range here of different things, both uh, public sector, graduate schemes, non-graduate schemes, uh, just to show the kind of variety of different things that you might consider. I'm going to particularly mention uh, what was known as NGDP, but is now called IMPACT, because that's the local government graduate scheme. It's quite similar to the fast stream in some respects, not the kind of hiring processes, but the work, except it's happening at local government level rather than national government level. I think it's one that sometimes gets overlooked, but it's a really good idea to kind of look at that if what you're interested in is government work. Or, of course, you could do something else entirely. I'm not going to go into the alternatives because there are so many different ones, but we can help you think that through here at the Career Service. We've got lots of support on our website. 
Remember, if you're not going for graduate schemes, you've got a little bit longer to work this out. The fast stream closes on the 7th of November, but other types of jobs will be advertised throughout the year. And there's a playlist here just to support you. This is just one of our resources that I'm highlighting to think about how you might pick a career if you're reconsidering your options. Some final thoughts, and these are from Cambridge alumni who've been through the process behind before you. Um, just give it a go. Be prepared that it might take a long time. It might be a slow process. I really like this one, that it's not necessarily the case that each bit is harder. It might just be a bit more. Um, again, encouraging you to kind of reapply if it's something you're interested in. Encouraging you not to take things too much to heart or kind of beat yourself up if you're not successful. We did have a couple of replies from people who were clearly quite frustrated with the process. And if that ends up being you, if you start to go through it and then you just feel like, oh, this isn't for me, either I'm not finding this recruitment process very helpful or maybe the job isn't for me, like that's OK. It's not for everyone and you're not the only one. Um, so if you can, try and take it as lightly as possible. If you are interested in working in the civil service, whether that's through the fast stream, the summer internship or something else, see if you can talk to civil service, serv sorry, civil servants. Um, Cambridge alumni is one way of doing that, but of course it's not the only one. They might be really happy to talk to you about the job and maybe share some examples of what helped them to be successful. Um, and I've just included this one because I had a couple of questions when I set this up from people who were worried that maybe a humanities degree wasn't setting them up for the civil service quite so well as a STEM degree would. Um, and I just wanted to include this one because this person actually felt their humanities degree had given them some good skills to do quite well in the process. So there are pros and cons no matter what you've studied. Good luck. If you do apply, I hope everything goes well for you.